All right. Good morning, EL support. Nice to kind of see you. Uh, it's Thursday, May 14th, and uh, we have the rest of this week, and then we have all of next week on this same schedule. And then after that, we have Memorial Day off, the, uh, what is it, May 28th and 29th? No, May 26th and 27th. And then the last class meeting is the 28th or 29th. For us, it'll be May 28th, will be the last, last class meeting. No final exam, as you know. Um, so, you know, we're in pretty good shape, but, and I hope all is well with you guys, of course. We're continuing our poetry series today. But what we're really looking at is what we call figurative language, that elastic, stretchable, super expansive type of language that says more than what it literally means. It stretches meaning. One is comparison. One type of figurative language is comparison. We've looked at three different types. We've looked at metaphor, we've looked at simile, we've looked at personification. Um, today I want to introduce another key piece of figurative language. These are actually probably the most four important ones. Um, and you've probably gotten this before, but it's symbol, symbol. And I have a very short poem today that I'm going to give you guys by one of my favorite poets, William Blake. Um, and it's called The Sick Rose, The Sick Rose. It features the use of symbol and it also features some other types of figurative language. So I'm going to be asking you guys to look for personification in there and ask you to look for some types of comparison, another type of comparison, all right? But symbol is the main thing that we're looking at. So hopefully you guys have had a chance to look at the agenda on the email that I sent you. That kind of rhymed. Um, I asked you to look up symbol and define it. And then I asked you, what could a rose be a symbol of? A rose, because that's what we're looking at. The star of our poem today is a rose, of all things. But so you guys wrote down whatever you're going to write down for symbol. I, of course, will furnish you with a definition. Then I'll flash the document up here on the screen, as I so often do. I'll briefly review it. And then I'll leave you guys to do it yourselves. And that will be due on Monday. OK. Um, on Monday, I'll give you another deer log to do. We'll keep that same pattern. And then next Thursday, I'll give you guys one more poem um, and ask you to look at some figurative language and investigate the meaning and all that. And that will be the last assignment that I give you. And we'll have some kind of summative activity um, the very last day, May, 20, May 28th, Thursday, May 28th. And it'll probably be you guys giving me feedback about the class and what worked and what I can do better as a teacher and all that stuff. So uh, for what it's worth, that's what we got. I'm giving you this poem today and this work on symbol. Monday will simply be a deer log that will be due the next Thursday. Next week, Thursday, I will give you one more poem and some things to think about. And that's pretty much it. Pretty much it. Uh, it's been fun. And I hope you guys are okay. It'll be weird to see you walk in the halls of Balboa, hopefully next year. And um, maybe you won't be in my class anymore. Anyway, um, so what is a symbol? I'm so glad you asked. Here's our definition we're working with. And I'll flash that example a little better in a minute. Symbol, an object, person, or action that means more or suggests more than what it literally is. So in literature, in a story, in a short story, in a poem, anything, in a movie, right? Um, <clears throat> symbols are meant to stretch meaning once again. So it can be a person, it can be an object, it can be an animal, it can be a plant, it can be an action that somebody performs, right? These can all have a symbolic meaning within the story. They mean what they mean, but they also suggest other meanings and in that way communicate more experience and information, right? Poetry is concerned with communicating lived experience in a meaningful way that the poet has thought about and then is communicated in this compressed form of language that we're talking about, poetic language. It doesn't even matter if it rhymes or if it's in little lines or whether it's just writing on a page. It can still be poetry if it features that compression of language, right? And that expansion of meaning. So that's weird, it both compresses and expands. Whoa, okay. So again, let me flash that for you. Symbol, certainly you guys have gotten this from your other English teachers, but these very short poems is not a bad way to look at how writers use these types of figurative language in a really limited, um, and we can really focus on it and look at this compression of language. So. Object, person, action, again, animal, plant, right? That means more than what it literally represents, okay? An example, let's look at an example of a rose. A rose is one of the most important symbols out there or the most well-used, right? 
what do you give somebody on Valentine's Day, for example? Oh, oh well, if you have a job, <laughs> you get them a dozen roses, but maybe you at least get your beloved one rose, right? The colors of the roses even have a symbolic signification, right? But anyway, um, you know, red means that you're really hot for that person. Like you maybe want to like get physical with them, right? Like passionate red. If you give somebody a white rose, it represents pure or spiritual love or an idealistic love, right? So it's like, you know, that eternal type of love. So white, be aware of what you're giving people as gifts, right? You're letting them know you're passionately into them or you're spiritually, uh, and let, you know, into them, and maybe you guys will meet in heaven or something. The yellow rose is typically for friendship, friendship with no sexual dimension or anything, just a platonic thing. So you can see that even colors come to have a symbolic representation, right? Anyway, a, a rose itself, look at the example here. Example, a rose is often a symbol of, or symbolizes, you could say it symbolizes, beauty, love, passion, or indeed life itself, right? The most famous symbolic meaning of a rose is probably love for the reasons that I just explained, um, this whole Valentine's Day thing, where you can give your beloved a token of your love and the rest of us who don't have a beloved can feel bad about ourselves, right? Valentine's Day, by the way, is a Hallmark holiday. Uh, it's made up by card corporations to make more money, right? But it's always nice to, you know, express your love on that special day. Naturally, you should, every day should be Valentine's Day. Um, but you know how we are. So a rose, ladies and gentlemen, a rose, may I suggest, the beauty of a rose. And it's different main symbolic meanings. You're gonna find that I think those four things, beauty, love, passion, life, think of each of those as a separate possible symbolic uh, meaning of a rose and see how it works in this poem. Because a really good poet or a really good writer They'll use symbols to mean more than one thing. It could mean two things, three things, four things. And in allowing that expansion of meaning, the poem says more. Suddenly you're not just talking about a rose anymore. You're talking about some aspect of human life or something that you've experienced and you wanna to communicate to somebody else, maybe because they've experienced the same thing. If you've ever had your heart broken, why are love songs so nice? Because someone else has been through it. You're not alone on the dark and cloudy day. Someone's there offering their hand to you. Look, I've been through that, man. I feel you. I hear you. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm still suffering in empathy a little bit with you. Anyway, shut up, Wilcox. So let me see about... Uh, <clears throat> let's do a screen share. Uh, there it is. And share it. Flash it. Okay, here we go. Look at this, Wilcox, master of technology. Okay, uh, William Blake, one of my favorite poets. And again, this is the sick rose, but here's the sheet that I will include as an attachment. It should be at the bottom of your little email there. And uh, these directions should be becoming pretty familiar to you. <sighs> Define the words below in English and in your primary language then read the poem and answer the questions on the other sheet. This is a two-pager, <laughs> unlike that last one. Um, and uh, this poem's written in the 1800s. And so it uses a couple of words that might be unfamiliar to you unless you've read Shakespeare or something, right? These are old forms of English that nobody really uses anymore. But if you like poetry or William Blake, you kind of have to know what they mean. So thou is one thou. Maybe you've heard of this, right? I think even some translations of the Bible into English use this sort of arcane language, but you guys will never use the word thou, all right? It's just not used anymore, not even in Britain, okay? But uh, so thou, invisible, worm, how, thy is another strange old arcane English word, okay? Basically thou means you and thy means your, your. Okay, but uh, go ahead and look those up anyway, and just to have those written down in your home language as well, just to make this as navigable, as doable, as uh, transversible as possible. Okay, crimson is another word that appears in here. So do your vocabulary work like you always do. I like to think that you guys might be generating new vocabulary in the process. But anyway, here you go, the sick rose. You can see it's only eight lines. There's two stanzas or sort of paragraphs, four lines each. 
the sick rose. O oh, rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. All right, short and simple, eight lines. What could really be going on in there? It's just about a rose and a worm, right? Well, it is about a rose and a worm, because if you know anything about roses, there's something called a canker worm, a little critter, a little insect, and it goes into the worm and it burrows into it and it sucks out all the life and it gets fat and happy, right? And then it maybe turns into a nasty fly or insect or something, right? But the worm burrows into the beautiful rose. We think of the worm as ugly, like horrible. And the rose is, you know, beautiful and, uh, you know, symbolizes all these wonderful things. But look at this poem. This gives you a worm burrowing into a rose, all right? So the question is, what can the figurative dimensions tease out of this? We know it's a worm burrowing into a rose, but what other meanings can we attach to that when we bring our life experience to bear and transpose it across poetic terrain like this? So here we go. Number one, what is personified in this poem? Look at that first line. Something is treated as a person. What could it be? Okay, so notice a good poet mixes different types of figurative language in and, you know, weaves them together into a beautiful tapestry or something like that. Um, number two, the storm, the howling storm. Okay, the storm's compared to something. It's compared to something which howls. It's sort of like that thing from Dream Deferred, right, where it asks if a Dream Deferred explodes. It doesn't tell you what it compares it to, but it suggests something by the language. And you have to kind of figure out, okay, what explodes? Oh, okay, in this case, what howls? What howls, all right? So the storm's howling. Uh, number three, what is the worm doing to the rose? And can I kind of explain that a little bit, but just look back in the text of the poem, give me a basic answer here. These answers do not have to be too long, you guys. Um, however, for number four here, this is where you kind of look at the main symbols in relation to each other. What might the worm and the rose represent as symbols? What are other things uh, that are, that we like, or that are perhaps people that are destroyed, right? What is the thing that destroys them? So just kind of look at that. You're looking at a worm destroying a rose, but if you look at what they represent and our feelings about them, what else does it suggest? Okay, and lastly, what might the night and the storm represent as symbols? That this poem, almost every single word or line contains a symbolic dimension or a figurative comparative dimension, right? And this is again, what the best poets do. Uh, so the night um, flies in the night and then the storm, right? Uh, night and storm, what do those make you feel? Uh, what do those suggest beyond their literal meanings? All right, so that's what I'm asking you guys to do. Please get that done by Monday. And uh, as you know, you might as well wait till Monday, but I, I will assign simply another deer log on Monday that will be the next Thursday. And then we have just one more piece of work in our poetry unit. I'll try and wrap it up. And uh, yeah, then believe it or not, the school year will be over. So um, hope you guys are taking care of yourselves and I hope your family's okay and everything. Um, enjoy this wonderful poem of corruption and darkness. And uh, anyway, maybe you can walk out of here with a slightly broadened understanding of the way that figurative language works, the way metaphors and personifications work with symbols to create this larger meaning. All right, you guys take care of yourselves now, and I'll tune in with you on Monday. Bye.